Wikipaka WG in this extremely crowded um, Esszimmer. I'm Jakob, I'm your hero for tonight until 10. Um, and I'm here to welcome you and to welcome these wonderful three guys on the stage. They're going to talk about the infrastructure of um, Wikipedia. Wikipedia and yeah, they are Lukas, Amir and Daniel and I hope you have fun. Um, hello, uh, my name is Amir. Uh, um, I'm a software engineer at Wikimedia Deutschland, uh, which is the German chapter of Wikimedia Foundation. Wikimedia Foundation runs Wikipedia. Uh, here is Lukas. Uh, Lukas is also a software engineer at Wikimedia Deutschland. Uh, and Daniel here is a software architect at Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, we are all based in Germany, Daniel Leipzig. We are in Berlin. Uh, and we, today we want to talk about how we run Wikipedia with using donors' money uh, and not lots of um, advertisement and uh, collecting data. Uh, so in this talk, uh, first we are going to uh, go uh, on an inside-out approach. So we are going to first talk about the application layer and then the outside layers, and then we go to an outside-in approach and then is talk about uh, uh, how you're going to uh, hit Wikipedia from the outside. Um, so some. Uh, so first of all, I let some. Let me get you some information. Uh, first of all, all of Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia infrastructure is run by uh, Wikimedia Foundation, an American nonprofit charitable organization. We don't run any ads, and we are only 370 people. Uh, if you count uh, Wikimedia Deutschland or all other chapters, it's around 500 people in total. It's nothing compared to the companies outside. Um, but all of the content is managed by volunteers. Even uh, our um, uh, staff doesn't do edit uh, add content to Wikipedia. And we support 300 languages, which is a very r large number. And uh, Wikipedia, it's 18 years old, so it can vote now. Um, uh, and also, Wikipedia hosts some really, really weird articles. Uh, um, I want to ask you what is your if you have encountered any any really weird article in Wikipedia. Uh, my favorite is a list of people who died on a toilet. Uh, but if you know anything, uh, raise your hand. Uh, do you know any weird articles in Wikipedia? Do you know some? Well, the, the classic one. Uh, me, the, you the need to unmute yourself. I need. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is technology. I, I don't know anything about technology. <laughs> okay. Uh, now the, my favorite example is uh, people killed by their own invention. That's, uh, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Look it up. <laughs> it's amazing. There's also a list, There's also a list of uh, prison escapes using helicopters. I almost said helicopter escapes using prisons, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> But oh. that was also be a very interesting list. I, th I think we also have a category of lists of lists of lists. And that's yes, a page. right. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and every few months, someone thinks it's funny to redirect it to Russell's paradox or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but also, beside that, people cannot uh, read uh, Wikipedia in Turkey or China. But three days ago, actually, the blog uh, in Turkey was ruled unconstitutional, but it's not lifted yet. Uh, hopefully, it will be lifted soon. Um, uh, so Wikipedia, Wikimedia project is just not Wikipedia, it's lots and lots of projects. Some of them are not as successful as the Wikipedia, um, uh, like Wikinews, but uh, for example, Wikipedia is uh, the most successful one. And there's another one that's Wikidata, it's being developed by Wikimedia Deutschland, I mean the Wikidata team uh, with Lucas. Um, and it's being used, it's Infobox, uh, it has the data that Wikipedia or Google Knowledge Graph or Siri or Alexa uses. Uh, it's basically a sort of a backbone of this, uh, all of the data uh, through the whole internet. Um, um, so our infrastructure, let me, uh, so first of all, uh, our infrastructure is all open source. By principle, we never use any commercial software. Uh, we could use uh, lots of things, they are even sometimes we were given us for free, but we were refuse to use them. Um, uh, second thing is we have two primary data centers for like failovers when, for example, a whole data center get goes offline, uh, so we can fail over to another data center. Uh, we have three caching points of presence or CDNs. Uh, 
Um, so our CDNs are all over the world. Uh, also, we have our own CDN. We don't have, uh, we don't use Cloudflare because Cloudflare, uh, we care about the, our privacy of the users, and uh, it's very important that, for example, people edit from countries that might be uh, dangerous for them uh, to edit Wikipedia. So we really care to keep the data as um, protected as possible. Um, uh, we have 17 billion page views per month, uh, and uh, which goes up and down based on the season and everything. Um, we have around 100 to 200,000 requests per second. Uh, it's different from the page view because requests can be requests to the objects, it can be API, lots of things. Uh, and we have 300,000 new editors per month, and we run all of this with 1,300 bare metal servers. Um, so. Right now, uh, Daniel is going to talk about the application layer and the inside, inside of the infrastructure. Thanks, Amir. Oh, the clicky thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the application layer is basically the software that actually does what a wiki does, right? It lets you edit pages, create uh, update pages, and then serves the page views. Um, the, the challenge for Wikipedia, of course, is serving all, all the many page views that Amir uh, just described. Um, the core of the application is a classic LAMP application. So it's I have to stop moving? Yes, is, is that it? <laughs> um, it's a classic LAMP stack application, so it's written in PHP, it runs on an Apache server, it uses um, MySQL as the database in the backend. Um, we used to use HHVM instead of the, um, yeah, we, hello, um, we used to use HHVM uh, as the PHP engine, but we just switched back to uh, the mainstream PHP using PHP 7.2 now. Uh, because Facebook decided that HHVM is going to be incompatible with the standard and they were just basically developing it for, for themselves. Um, right, so we have separate clusters of servers uh, for serving requests, for serving different requests, um, page views on the one hand and also, also, also uh, handling edits. Then we have a cluster for handling um, API calls. And then we have a bunch of servers set up to handle um, asynchronous jobs, things that happen in the background, uh, the, the job runners. And I guess video scaling is a very uh, obvious example of that. It just takes too long to do it on the fly. Uh, but we use it for many other things as well. Uh, MediaWiki Media Wiki is kind of an amazing thing because you can just install it on your own sh shared hosting, 10 bucks a month. Um, web space and it will run, um, but you can also use it to, you know, serve half the world, and so it's a very powerful and versatile system. Uh, which also, I mean, this um, this wide span of different applications also creates problems. Uh, that's something that I will uh, talk about tomorrow. Um, but for now, let's look at the fun things. So, if you want to serve a lot of uh, page views you have to do a lot of caching and so we have a whole yeah a whole set of different caching systems uh, the most important one is probably the parser cache so uh, as you probably know wiki pages are uh, created in in a markup language wiki text and they need to be parsed and turned into html <coughs> and uh, the result of that parsing is of course cached and uh, that cache is semi persistent it nothing really ever drops out of it. It's a huge thing, and it's uh, it lives in a um, dedicated MySQL database system. Um, yeah, we use memcached a lot for all kinds of miscellaneous things, uh, anything that we need to keep around and share between server instances. And um, we have been using Redis for a while for anything that we want to have uh, available not just between different servers but also between different data centers because Redis is a bit better about synchronizing things between um, between different systems. We still use it uh, for session storage especially though we are about to move away from that and um, we'll be using Cassandra for session storage. 
We have a bunch of um, additional services running for uh, specialized purposes, like um, scaling, scal scaling images, um, rendering formulas, math formulas. Um, ORIS is pretty interesting. ORIS is a system for automatically detecting vandalism or rating edits. So this is a machine learning based system for detecting problems and highlighting edits that may not be may not be great and need more attention. Um, we have some additional services that process um, our content for consumption on mobile devices, chopping pages up into bits and pieces that then can be uh, consumed individually, and yeah, many, many more. In the background, we also have to manage um, events, right? We use um, Kafka for message queuing, and we use that to notify uh, different parts of the system about changes. Um, on the one hand, we use that to feed the, the job runners that I, I just mentioned. Um, but we also use it, for instance, to, to purge the uh, entries in the CDN when pages become updated and things like that. OK, the next session is going to be about uh, the databases. Uh, are there, very quickly, we will have uh, quite a bit of time for discussion afterwards, but are there any questions right now about what um, we said so far? Everything extremely crystal clear? OK, no clarities left? I see. Oh, one question in the back. Can you maybe turn the volume up a little bit? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, your section, right? Oh, oh it's Amir again. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, I want to talk about my favorite topic: uh, the dungeons of uh, dungeons of every production system, databases. Uh, the database of Wikipedia is really interesting and complicated on its own. Uh, we use MariaDB. Uh, we uh, switched from MySQL uh, in 2013 for lots of complicated reasons. Uh, as, as I said, because we are really open source, uh, you can go not just check our d uh, database tree uh, that uh, says like how it looks and what's the replicas and uh, masters. Actually, you can even query the Wikipedia's database live. Even you have that, uh, you can just go to that uh, address and log in with your Wikipedia account and just you can do whatever you want. Uh, like it, it was a funny thing that a couple of months ago someone sent me a message uh, sent me a message like oh I found a security issue you can uh, just uh, query Wikipedia's database I was like no no it's actually we, we let this happen uh, it's like uh, it's sanitized we removed the password hashes and everything but it's still uh, you can use this um, and uh, but if you wanted to say like how the clusters work the database clusters because it gets too big uh, they first started sharding but now we have sections that are basically different clusters uh, really large wikis have their own uh, section for example english wikipedia uh, is s1 uh, uh, german wikipedia with two or three other small wikis are in s5 um, wikidata is on s8 and so on um, and each section have uh, a master and uh, several replicas, uh, but one of the replicas is actually a master in another data center because of the failover that I told you. Um, so it, ha it basically two layers of uh, replication exist. Um, this is uh, what I'm telling you is about metadata, uh, but for Wikitex, uh, we also need to have a complete different uh, uh, set of databases, but it can be, it, we use consistent hashing to just scale it horizontally, so we can just uh, put more uh, databases on it um, for that. Uh, but I don't know if you know it, but Wikipedia stores every edit. So you have the text of Wikitex of every edit in the whole history in the database. Um, also, we have parser cache that Daniel explained, uh, and uh, parser cache is also consistent hashing, so we just can uh, horizontally uh, scale it, but for metadata, it's, it's slightly more complicated. Um, metadata shows uh, and is being used to render the page. Uh, um, so, in order to do this, this is, for example, a very 
short version of the uh, data history that I showed you. You can even go and look it up for other ones. Uh, but this is a S1. Uh, S1 IKEA is the main data center. Uh, the master is this number, and it replicates to some of this. And then the, seven, the second one that starts with 2000, because it's the second data center. And it's a master of the other one. <laughs> uh, and uh, and it has its own replications. Um, between cross CC replications, because uh, the master, uh, that's ma master data center is in Ashburn, Virginia. Um, the second data center is in Dallas, Texas. Uh, so they need to have a, a cross CC uh, replication. And that happens with a TLS to make sure that no one starts to listen to in between these two. Um, and we have snapshots and even uh, dumps of the whole history of Wikipedia. You can go to dumps.wikimedia.org and download the whole history of every wiki you want, uh, uh, except the ones that we had to remove for uh, privacy reasons. Um, and uh, with back loss and loss of backups. Uh, I recently realized we have loss of backups. Um, and in total, it's 570 terabytes of data and uh, total 150 database servers. And uh, queries that happens to them is around 350,000 uh, queries per second. And in total, it requires 70 terabytes of RAM. Um, so, um, and also we have another uh, storage uh, section that called Elasticsearch, uh, which you can guess it, it's being used for search uh, on the top right. If you're using desktop, it's different in uh, mobile, I think. And also it depends on if you're a RTL language as well. Uh, but also it runs by a team called Search Platform because none of us are from Search Platform. We cannot explain it this much. Uh, we don't know much how it works. It's a lightly. Uh, uh, also, we have a media storage for all of the free pictures that is being uploaded to uh, Wikimedia. Like, uh, for example, we have a category in Commons. Commons is our wiki that holds all of the free media. Um, and we have a category in Commons called Cats Looking at Left, and we have category Cats Looking at Right. Uh, so we have lots and lots of images. Um, it's 390 terabytes of media, one uh, billion objects, and uses Swift. Uh, Swift is the object storage component of OpenStack, um, and it has uh, it has several layers of caching: front end, back end. Um, um, yeah, that's mostly it. Uh, and we want to talk about traffic now. Um, so this picture is when Sweden in 1967 uh, moved from a left, driving from left to driving to the right. This is basically what happens in Wikipedia infrastructure as well. Um, so we have five uh, caching layers. Uh, and then the most recent one is Xin, which is in Singapore. Uh, the three one uh, are just CDN, ULSFO, IKEA, the SAMS, and Xin. Um, Sorry, ULF software, SAMS, and Exxon are just CDNs. Uh, we have also two points of presence, one in Chicago, and the other one is also in Amsterdam. Um, uh, but we don't get to that. Uh, so um, we have, as I said, we have our own uh, content delivery network. Uh, with our traffic, our location is done by GeoDNS, uh, which actually is written and maintained by one of the traffic people. Um, and we can pull and depool DCs. It has a time to leave of 10, min 10 minutes. So if a data center goes down, uh, we have it takes 10 minutes to actually propagate uh, for being depooled uh, and repooled again. Um, and we use LVS as transport layer. And uh, which one is the fourth layer? Uh, this layer three and four of the Linux uh, load balancer. Um, uh, for Linux and it supports consistent hashing, and also we uh, we got we grew so big that we needed to uh, have something that manages the load balancer. So we wrote something on our own system, which is called Pyball, um, and also we uh, lots of companies actually peer with us. Uh, we, for example, directly connect to Amsterdam uh, AmsX. Uh, um, so this is how the caching works. Which is uh, anyway, it's, there is lots of reasons for this. Uh, let's just get started. We use TLS. Uh, we support TLS 1.2, um, where we have TL then the first layer we have nginx minus. Uh, do you know? D does anyone know what nginx minus means? Um, so that's uh, related, but not not correct. Um, so. We have Nginx, which is the free version, and we have Nginx Plus, that, which is the commercial version. And Nginx, uh, but we don't use Nginx to do load balancing or anything, so we stripped out everything from it. 
uh, and we just use it for TLS termination, so we call it Nginx minus. It's an internal joke. Uh, uh, so, and then we have Varnish front end. Uh, Varnish also is a caching layer, um, and uh, this the front end is on the memory, which is very very fast. And we have the back end, which is on the uh, storage and the hard disk, but it's a slow. Uh, the fun thing is like just CDN. Um, a caching layer takes 90% of our requests. It responds at 90% of requests just gets to the varnish and just return. Um, and then if it doesn't work, it goes to the application layer. The varnish uh, holds, um, uh, it has a TTL of uh, 24 hours. So if you change an article, it also gets invalidated uh, by the application. So if someone edits, uh, the CDN actually purges the result. Um, and the thing is, uh, the front end is sharded by, uh, by request. So you come here, Load Blaster just randomly sends your request to a front end. But then the back end is actually, uh, if the front end can't find it, it sends it to the back end. And the back end is actually um, uh, sort of, uh, how is it called? It's uh, ha used hash by the request. So for example, article of Barack Obama is only being served from one node in the uh, data center in the CDN. Uh, if none of this work is actually hits uh, the other data center. Um, so yeah, I actually explained all of this. Um, so we have two, uh, two caching uh, clusters. Uh, one is called text, and the other one is called upload. It's not confusing at all. Um, and uh, if you want to um, find out, you can just do mtren.wikipedia.org, and you, uh, your, the end node is textlb.wikimedia.org, which is the our text uh, storage, but if you go to upload.wikimedia.org, you get to the hit the upload node uh, cluster. Um, uh, yeah, this is so far, what is it? Uh, and it has lots of problems because a varnish is uh, open core, uh, so the version that we use is open source. Uh, we don't use the commercial one, uh, but the open core one doesn't support TLS. Uh, what? What happened? Okay. No, no. You should. You're not supposed to say this. Okay. Sorry for the. Br huh? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so Varnish has lots of problems. Varnish is open core. It doesn't uh, support uh, TLS termination, which makes us to have this nginx minus their system just to do TLS termination. Uh, makes our system complicated. It doesn't work very well with Swift. That causes us to have a cron job to restart every Varnish node uh, twice a week. We, so we have a cron job that just restarts every Varnish node, uh, which is embarrassing. Uh, but also, uh, on the other hand, when the um, end of Varnish, like backend, wants to talk to the application layer, it also doesn't support termi uh, TLS termination. So we use IPsec, which is even more embarrassing. Uh, but uh, we are changing it. Uh, so we call it, uh, a, we are using Apache Traffic Server, which is a very, very nice. And it's also uh, open source, uh, fully open source, like in, uh, with Apache Foundation. Uh, Apache does the TLS, ATS does the TLS by, uh, termination. And still, for now, we have a, a Varnish front end that uh, still exists. But the back end is also going to change to the ATS. Um, so we call this ATS sandwich. Uh, Two ATS happening between, uh, and the, at the middle there is a varnish. The good thing is that the TLS uh, termination, when it moves to uh, ATS, you can actually use uh, TLS 1.3, which is more modern and more secure and even way faster. Um, so it basically drops 100 milliseconds from every request that goes to Wikipedia. That translates to centuries of our users' time every month. Uh, but ATS is going on, and hopefully it will go live soon. Um, and once these are done, um, so this is the new version. Uh, and as I said, the TLS, and the, when we can do this, we can actually use the more secure instead of IPsec uh, to uh, talk about between data centers. Um, uh, yes. And now it's the time uh, that Lucas talks about what happens when you type en.wikipedia.org. Okay. Do you want? Thanks, Samir. Yes, this makes sense. Thank you. 
Um, so uh, first of all, what you see on the slide here is the image doesn't really have anything to do with what happens when you type en wikipedia.org because it's an offline Wikipedia reader, but it's just a nice image. Uh, so this is basically a summary of everything they already said. So if, uh, which is the most common case, you are lucky and uh, get a URL which is cached, then uh, so first your computer asks for the IP address of en wikipedia.org. It reaches this uh, global DNS daemon. And because we're at Congress here, it tells you the closest data center is the one in Amsterdam, so ESMs. And it's going to hit the edge, um, what's it called, load balancer slash router there, then going through TLS termination through engine X minus. And then it's going to hit, hit the varnish caching server, either front end or back end. And then you get a response, and that's already it. And nothing else is ever bothered again. It doesn't even reach any other data center, which is very nice. And so that's, you said, around 90% of uh, the requests we get. And if you're unlucky and the URL you requested is not in the varnish in the Amsterdam data center, then it gets forwarded to the Ikiad data center, which is the primary one. And there it still has a chance to hit the cache. And perhaps this time it's there. And then the response is going to be cached in the front end, no, in the Amsterdam varnish. And you're also going to get a response. And we still don't have to run any application stuff. If we do have to hit any application stuff, then Varnish is going to forward that. If it's upload.wikimedia.org, it goes to the media storage, Swift. If it's any other domain, it goes to MediaWiki. And then MediaWiki does a ton of work to uh, connect to the database, in this case, the uh, first chart for English Wikipedia, get the wiki text from there, get the wiki text of all the related pages and templates. Um, no, wait, I forgot something. First, it checks if the HTML for this page is available in parser cache. So that's another caching layer. And this application, ca this parser cache might either be memcached or uh, the database cache behind it. And if it's not there, then it has to go get the wiki text, get all the related things, and render that into HTML, which takes a long time, and goes through some pretty ancient code. And if you are doing an edit or an upload, it's even worse. Uh, because then it always has to go to MediaWiki, and then it not only has to store this uh, new edit either in the media backend or in the database, it also has to update a bunch of stuff, like especially if you, no, first of all, um, it has to purge the cache. It has to tell all the Varnish servers that there's a new version of this URL available so that, that it doesn't take a full day until the time to live expires. It also has to update a bunch of things. For example, if you edited a template, it might have been used in a million pages. And the next time anyone requests one of those million pages, those should also actually be um, rendered again using the new version of the template. So it has to invalidate the cache for all of those. And all of that is deferred through the job queue. And it might have to calculate thumbnails if you uploaded the file or um, create uh, retranscribe media files, because maybe you uploaded in, uh, what do we support? You upload in WebM, and the browser only supports some other media codec or something. We transcode that and also encode it down to different resolutions. So then it goes through that whole dance. And yeah, that was already those nights. Is Amir going to talk again about how we manage me? Uh, OK, yeah. Uh, I quickly come back just for a short break uh, to talk about managing to manage, because uh, managing 1,300 1, uh, bare metal hardware plus a Kubernetes cluster is not easy. Uh, so what we do is that we use Puppet for uh, configuration management in our bare metal systems. It's fun. Five to 50,000 lines of Puppet code. I mean, lines of code is not a great indicator, but you can roughly get an estimate of how it, things work. And we have 100,000 lines of Ruby. Um, and we have uh, our CI and CD cluster. We have, so we don't store anything in GitHub or uh, GitLab. We have our own system, which is based on Garrett. Um, and uh, for that, we have uh, our system of Jenkins. And the Jenkins does all of this kind of things. Uh, and uh, also, because we have a Kubernetes cluster for uh, services, some of our services, if you merge a merge change in the Garrett, it also builds the Docker files and containers and push it up to the production. Uh, and also, in order to run um, uh, remote uh, 
as a search comments, we have cumin that's like in-house automation, and we built this for our, for our systems. And for example, you go there and say, OK, you pull this node, or uh, run this command in all of the data varnish nodes that I told you, like you want to restart them. Um, and with this, I get back to Lucas. Yeah. So I am going to talk a bit more about Wikimedia Cloud Services, which is a bit different in that it's not really our production stuff, but it's where you people, uh, the volunteers of the Wikimedia movement, can run their own code. So you can request a project, which is kind of a group of users, and then you get assigned a pool of you have this much CPU and this much RAM, and you can create uh, virtual machines with those resources and then do stuff there and um, run basically whatever you want um, to create and boot and shut down the VMs and stuff. We use OpenStack, and there's a Horizon front end for that, which you use through the browser, and it logs you out all the time, but otherwise it works pretty well. Internally, ideally, you manage the VMs using Puppet, but a lot of people just SSH in and then do whatever they need to set up the VM manually, and it happens. Well. And there's a few big projects like Toolforge, where you can run uh, your own web-based tools, or the beta cluster, which is basically a copy of some of the biggest wikis. Like there's a beta English Wikipedia, beta Wikidata, beta Wikimedia Commons, using mostly the same configuration as production, but uh, using the current master version of the software instead of whatever we deploy once a week. So if there's a bug, we see it earlier, hopefully, even if we didn't catch it locally, because the beta cluster is more similar to the production environment. And also the continuous, continuous integration servers run in Wikimedia Cloud Services as well. Yeah, And also, you have to have Kubernetes somewhere on these slides, right? So you can use that to distribute work uh, between the tools in Toolforge. Or you can use the Grid Engine, which does a similar thing, but it's like three decades old. And through five forks now, I think the current fork we use is Son of Grid Engine, and I don't know what it was called before. But that's cloud services. Um, so in a nutshell, um, this is our all systems. Uh, we have uh, 1,300 bare metal services with lots and lots of caching, like lots of layers of caching, because mostly we serve read, and uh, we can just keep them uh, as a cached version. Um, and all of this is open source. You can contribute to it if you want to. Uh, and there's like all of configuration is also open and I, this is the way I got hired. Like I open, started contributing to the system and people were like, yeah, you can uh, come and work for us. Uh, so this is a... Uh, That's actually how all of us got hired. Uh, so yeah, and um, this is the whole uh, thing that uh, happens uh, in Wikimedia. And if you want to, oh, no, uh, if you want to, uh, help us. Uh, we, we are hiring. Uh, you can just go to jobs.wikimedia.org. Uh, if you want to work for Wikimedia Foundation, if you want to work with Wikimedia Deutschland, you can go to wikimedia.de and at the bottom there's a link for jobs because the link was too long. Um, if you can uh, contribute, if you want to contribute to us, there's uh, so many ways to contribute. Uh, as I said, there's so many bugs. We have our own uh, Grafana system. Uh, you can just look at the monitor and uh, Fabricator is our bug tracker. You can just go there and find the bug and fix things. Uh, um, uh, actually, uh, we have one uh, repository that is private, but it only holds the certificates for S TLS and uh, things that are really, really private. Then we cannot remove them. Um, but also, there are documentations. Uh, the documentation for infrastructure is at wikitech.wikimedia.org, and documentation for configuration is at knock.wikimedia.org, plus the uh, documentation of uh, our code base. Uh, uh, the documentation for MediaWiki itself is at mediawiki.org. Uh, and also, we have a, our own system of URL shortener. You can go to w.wiki and short, shorten any URL in Wikimedia structure. Uh, so we reserve the donor sign for the donate side. Uh, um, and yeah, if you have any questions, please. We have right. quite a bit of time for questions, so if anything wasn't clear or they're curious about anything, please, please ask. So. 
Uh, one question, what is not in the presentation. Do we have any efforts with hacking attacks? Um, so the first rule of security issues is that we don't talk about security issues, uh, but uh, uh, let's say this way, we have all sorts of attacks happening. Uh, we have usually, uh, we have DDoS. Uh, uh, once there was happening a couple of months ago that was very successful. Uh, I don't know if you read the news about that. Uh, but uh, we also, we have a infrastructure to handle this. We have a security team that handles these cases. And um, yes. Hi, hello. Uh, how do you manage access to your infrastructure from your employees? Um, so it's uh, SS so we have a LDAP group uh, and with the LDAP for the web-based systems, but we uh, SSH and uh, for the SSH we have a, a strict protocols and then you get a private key uh, and some people usually protect a private key using UB keys and then uh, you have you can SSH to the system basically. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, there's some firewalling setup that there's only one server per data center that you can actually reach through SSH and then you have to tunnel through that to get to any other server. Um, and also, like, uh, we, have, we have an internal firewall. And it's basically if you go to the inside of the production, you cannot talk to the outside. Uh, uh, you, you even you, for example, do git clone github.org, it doesn't, it, uh, it github.com doesn't work. It only can access uh, tools that are for inside the Wikimedia Foundation infrastructure. Um. OK, hi. Uh, you said you do TLS uh, termination through NGINX. Uh, do you still allow non-HTTPS, so HTTP non-secure access? Uh, no, we we dropped it a really long time ago. Uh, but 2013 also or so? Yeah, uh, 2000, uh, no, 2015. Uh, 2013, 15, we okay. started uh, serving the most of the traffic. Uh, but 15, we dropped all of the uh, HTTP, non-HTTPS uh, protocols. And recently, we even uh, dropped, and we are not serving uh, any SSL requests anymore. Uh, and TLS 1.1 is also being uh, phased out. So we are sending uh, warnings to the users like, you're using TLS 1.1, please uh, migrate to these new things that uh, came out around 10 years ago. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the deadline for that is like February 2020 or something, and then we'll only have TLS 1.2. Yeah. And soon or we yeah. are going to support TLS 1.3. Yeah. Are there any, uh, yeah, question? Uh, so does read-only traffic from logged-in users hit all the way through to the parser cache, or is there another layer of, of caching for that? Yes, uh, we, what if we bypass all of that. Yeah, you can. We need mi one more microphone. <laughs> um, yes, it actually does. And this is a, a pretty big problem and something we want to look into. <clears throat> but it requires quite a bit of re-architecting. If you are interested in this kind of thing, maybe come to my talk tomorrow at noon. Yeah, uh, one reason we can we are planning to do is active active. So we have two primaries, and uh, the read request gets request to uh, um, uh, from logged in users can hit the secondary data center instead of the main one. I think there was a question way in the back there yeah. for some time already. Uh, hi, uh, I got a question. Um, I read on uh, Wikitech that you're using Ganetti uh, as a virtualization platform for some parts. Uh, can you tell us something about this or um, what parts of uh, Wikipedia or Wikimedia are hosted on this platform? Uh, I am I'm not a sorry, so I don't know this kind of uh, very, very sure, but uh, take it with a grain of salt. But as far as I know, Granati is used to build a very small VMs in productions that we need for very, very small micro sites that we serve to the users. So we build just one or two VMs. Uh, we don't use it very, um, as often as I, I think so. Do you also think about open hardware? Um, I don't, uh, we can... Not, not for servers. I think uh, for the offline reader project, but this is not actually run by the foundation. It's supported, but it's not something that the foundation does. There was a lot of thinking about open hardware, but really open hardware in practice usually means you, you don't, you know, if you really want to go down to the chip design, it's pretty tough. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it's usually not practical, sadly. And one thing I can say about this is that uh, we have a 
s some uh, mach machines that are really powerful that we give to the researchers to run uh, uh, analysis on the Wikimedia uh, itself, uh, and uh, we needed to have GPUs for those. But the problem was was there wasn't any open source driver for them. So we I th migrated and used AMD, I think, but AMD didn't fit in the rack. It was a quite a endeavor to get it to work for our researchers to have used GPU. Uh, Um, I'm still impressed that you answer 90% out of the cache. Do all people uh, access the same pages or is the cache that huge? So uh, what percentage of, of, uh, uh, of the whole database is in the cache then? Um. I don't have the exact numbers to be honest, but a large percentage of the whole database is in the cache. Uh, I mean, it expires after 24 hours, so uh, really obscure stuff isn't there. But um, I mean, it's a, it's a uh, it's a it's a parallel distribution, right? You have a few pages that are accessed a lot, and you have many, many, many pages that are not actually accessed at all for a week or so, uh, except maybe for a crawler. Um, so I, I don't know a number. My guess would be it's less than 50% that is actually cached, but you know that still covers 90%. It probably the top 10% of pages would still cover 90% of the uh, page views. Uh, but I don't. This would be actually. Uh, I should look this up. It uh, would be interesting numbers to have. Yes. Yeah, Do you know if this is 90% of the page views or 90% of the get requests because like requests for the JavaScript would also be cached more often I assume I would expect that for non page views it's even higher yeah yeah, yeah because you know all the icons and and uh, you know JavaScript bundles and CSS and stuff doesn't ever change unless it's that's the same for everyone inflating the 90% but yeah. there's a question back there hey um, do your data centers run on green energy? Um, very valid question. Uh, so the Amsterdam CDN one is uh, full green, uh, uh, but the other ones are partially green, partially uh, coal and like gas. Um, uh, as far as I know, there are some plans to uh, make them uh, move away from it. But the other hand, uh, we realize that uh, we don't produce as much as uh, carbon emission because uh, we don't uh, have uh, much servers and we don't uh, use much data. Uh, there was an estimation and, uh, that we realized our carbon emission is basically as the same as 200 and in the data center, plus all of the travel that uh, all of the staff do uh, and all of the events is uh, 250 households. It's very, very small. Uh, it's, I think it's one thousandth of the it's, uh, compar uh, comparable traffic with Facebook, uh, even if you just cut down with the tr same traffic, uh, because Facebook uh, collects the data, uh, it runs very uh, sophisticated machine learning algorithms. That's, that's a real complicated. But for Wikimedia, we don't do this, so we don't need much energy. Does, does that answer your question? Do you have um, any other questions, le questions left? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, how many developers do you need to maintain the whole infrastructure? And how many developers, or let's say developer hours, you needed to build the whole infrastructure? Like, the question is because what I find very interesting about the talk is a nonprofit. So, as an example for other nonprofits, is how, how much money are we talking about in order to build something like this as a digital common? Um. <laughs> so if, if this is just about actually running all this, so just operations, it's less than 20 people, I think, which makes, if you, if you basically divide the request per second by people, you get to something like 8,000 requests per second per operations engineer, uh, which I think is a pretty impressive number. This is probably a lot higher. I would, I would really like to know if there's any organization uh, that, uh, that tops that. Um, I don't actually know the, tot the, the actual operations budget. I don't know, is it two, two, gi two digit millions uh, annually? Um, total hours for building this over the last 18 years? I have no idea. For the 
for the first five or so years, the people doing it were actually volunteers. Um, we still had volunteer database administrators and stuff until yeah, maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago. So yeah, it's, it's really, nobody did any accounting of this. I can only guess. Um, hello, a uh, tools question. Uh, a few years back, I saw some interesting examples of uh, salt stack use uh, for Wikimedia, but right now I see only Puppet that Kamin mentioned. So, kind of what happened with that? Um, I think we dished salt stack. Uh, if you, uh, I, I don't, uh, I cannot, uh, because none of us are in the cloud services team and uh, I don't think I can t answer you, but if you look at the Wikitech, the Wikimedia.org, it's probably, if last time I checked, it says like it's deprecated and obsolete. We don't use it anymore. Uh, do you use the bad jobs, like the job runners, to fill spare capacity on the web serving servers, or do you um, have dedicated servers for the roles? I think they're dedicated, right? Uh, the job runners. Uh, if you're asking, job runners are dedicated. Yes, yes they are. They are. Uh, I think five per primary data center. Uh, so yeah, and they don't. I mean, Sorry, do 20. we do we actually have any spare capacity on anything? Uh, we don't have that much hardware. Everything is pretty much at a hundred percent. I think we still have some server that is just called MISC one 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 or something, which run five different things at once. <laughs> you can yeah. look for those on Wikitech. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, uh, sorry, uh, it's not five. It's uh, twenty per data center, pr twenty per primary data center. That's our job runner, um, and they run uh, seven hundred jobs per second. And I think that does not include the video scalers, right? Those are separate again. No, no, they are, they merged them like uh, two oh. months ago. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Maybe a little bit of topic, but can you tell us a little bit about the uh, decision-making process for, for technical decision, architecture decisions? How, how does it work in an organization like this? Uh, decision-making process for, for architecture decisions, for example. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Wikimedia has uh, a, a committee for making um, high-level technical decisions called the Wikimedia um, Technical Committee, TechCom, and uh, we run an RFC process. So, any any decision that is cross-cutting, strategic, or, or especially hard to undo, uh, should go through this process. And it's pretty informal. Basically, you file a ticket and um, start start this uh, this process. It gets announced on the mailing list. Uh, hopefully, you get input and feedback. Um, and at some point, it is uh, it's approved for implementation. Uh, we're currently looking into improving this process it's not sometimes it works pretty well sometimes things don't get that much feedback but it still it makes sure that uh, people are aware of of these high level decisions uh, daniel is the chair of that committee so yeah if you want to complain about the process please do Yes, regarding CI and CD across the, along the pipeline, um, of course, with that much traffic, um, you want to keep everything consistent, right? So, um, is there any any testing strategies that you have set internally? Like, of course, unit tests, integration tests, but do you do something like continuous end-to-end -end testing on beta instances? Um, so, uh, we have beta cluster. Uh, but also we do deploy, we call it train, and uh, so we deploy once a week. Uh, all of the changes gets merged to one, uh, like a, a branch, and then the branch gets cut in every Tuesday, and it first goes to the test wikis, and it, uh, then it goes to all of wikis that are not Wikipedia, except Catalan and Hebrew Wikipedia. Uh, so basically Hebrew and Catalan Wikipedia volunteer to be the guinea pigs of the next wikis. Uh, and if everything works fine, usually it goes there and there's like, oh, the fatal monitor and we have a logging and then it's like, okay, we need to fix this and we fix it uh, immediately and then it goes live to all wikis. Uh, this is one way of uh, looking at it also. Okay. Yeah. So our test coverage is not as great as it should be. And so we kind of you know, abuse our users. 
uh, <laughs> for this. Um, we are, of course, working to improve this. And one thing that we started recently is a program for creating end-to-end uh, -end tests for all the API modules we have. And in the hope that we can thereby cover pretty much all of the application logic, um, bypassing the user interface. I mean, the full end-to-end -end should, of course, include the user interface. But user interface tests are pretty brittle and often test you know, where things are in the screen. And uh, it just seems to us that it makes a lot of sense to have more, to have tests that actually t test the application logic for what the system actually should be doing uh, rather than what it should look like. And um, yeah, we are currently working um, on making, so yeah, basically this has been a proof of concept and we're currently working to actually integrate it in, in CI. Um, that patch should land, I don't know, when, once everyone is back from the vacations. And uh, then we have to write about a thousand or so tests, I guess. <laughs> I think there's also a plan to move to a system where we actually uh, deploy basically after every commit and can immediately roll back if something goes wrong. But that's more midterm stuff, and I'm not sure what the current status of that proposal is. It, and it will be in Kubernetes, so it will be completely different. That would be amazing. Yeah. But right now, we are on this uh, weekly basis. If something goes wrong, we roll back to the last week's version of the code. Are there any questions questions left? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, um I don't think so. So um yeah, thank you for this wonderful talk. Thank you for all your questions. Um yeah, I hope yeah. you liked it. Um see you around the thank next you. Talk. Yeah. No applause. <laughs>